A man chooses, a slave obeys. Welcome to the Ethics and Video Games podcast, where we explore issues at the intersection of ethics and video games. What follows is a series of graphic, interactive scenes that we can't show you. So last week we talked about games that involve virtual pedophilia. Um, and when I say virtual pedophilia, I mean we were talking about the difference between – or if there was one between virtual murder and virtual pedophilia. And we talked about the ethics of playing a game that uh, had virtual pedophilia in it as opposed to playing a game that had virtual murder. Now, if you haven't heard that episode, check it out. It's a really good one. Um, now, when you hear something like a game with virtual pedophilia – you're probably thinking, wow, that's a bad game, and you know something should be done about that, right? There shouldn't be games like that out there. So here's a, another candidate for a game you might think is morally bad uh, that we've talked about before, uh, mm -hmm. Ray Play, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So right, that's a hentai game. The point of the game is to stalk a mother and her two daughters, their two teenage daughters, um, then kidnap and graphically rape them. Um, you know, and you must, and you ask yourself, okay, is is that a bad game? I mean, um. By the or is way, it a I, bad game designer? It was a okay, which is interesting, <laughs> right? Did, we could we can ask this question a whole lot of ways, right, Andy? We mm -hmm. could ask: Did the game designer do something bad, or is the game itself bad? Right. Mm -hmm. So today we're just focusing on kind of like: Is the game itself a bad thing? Like right? like an immoral game, not necessarily just an unfun game. Definitely, because the game could be fun but immoral. So we're looking at morally bad because this is the ethics and, and video games podcast, right? Right. Uh, okay. Um, I've got a whole bunch of candidates. Do you, do you, do you have any favorite games that are like, you know, that are like potentially immoral games? Well, um, there was a lot of, a lot of hubbaloo about, um, Grand Theft Auto when it first came out, or I should say it, not, not the original Grand Theft Auto, but I think Grand Theft Auto three, that was the where you could, uh, kill hookers for money. Right. Um, now you didn't have to, of course, but if you, you know, you you could you could you could take a little time with a with a sex worker in that game, and uh, and you know something would happen off screen, a little the car would get a little steamy or whatever happened, and then you would give them money, and then you would go, oh, this person has money, and if you kill them, then they drop their money, and you can take their money. So just like when you if you killed anybody in that game, you could just kill them and take their money. I think you got a reward. For being with the hooker of some kind, but I don't remember. I think it, you a got a little, you got a little bit of your health back if you if oh. you were down health, you got a little health back. Right. Um, so, but now you know. To their credit, the game does never never requires you to do it, and never actually requires you to kill anyone. Right. Uh, right. And there's but, people that play GTA that way. Try not right, to kill anyone in GTA. But it'll. But they allow it. Right. And they do reward you a little bit for it. Right. And notice, you might think that the reward that you're getting, right, maybe that's maybe the bad part. If you think right. Although they're bad. not rewarding you for the killing. Well, I guess they are rewarding you for the killing. You get your money back. Right. Uh, right. But you don't get any more than your money back. But you do get your health and your money. So the whole action, right? It, right. right the, the game mechanics are rewarding you for, for the whole action. That's right. Cool. Um, you want to trade off uh, with a couple? Oh, go for it. Yeah. All right. Uh, so, you know, we, we've talked about a, uh, a few. I, I just want to kind of remind the, the let's say, our, our listeners. How about uh, ethnic cleansing? Uh, ethnic cleanses, cleansing was essentially, I think they used a Quake engine or something. And, uh, right, it's a game where you just, it's a super racist game. You go around and you um, essentially kill the brown people and eventually they're uh, Jewish overlords, right? Now, you know, that's the kind of game where you're sure. like, oh, my God, that is a bad game. Right, right. It's certainly spreading, spreading, you know, dangerous and 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 racist ideas, which is interesting, right? If notice that sounds bad, right? And our question today is going to be that doesn't just sound bad. I mean, that is bad, right? Right. Uh, and our our question today is going to be okay. So that's bad, but does that make the game bad? Right. That's what we're like, looking for. W right. And 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 I wonder, can games be bad at all? Which is like, interesting. Like, is is it, or is it like a pen? Like, is this a can this pen be immoral? Right, right. A pen, a pen is a tool, 
right? Right. Right. Can technology, is technology itself just, you know, immoral? Right. Or, sorry, amoral. I could, right. if I use this pen to spread a lot of lies and racist and dangerous ideas, does the pen become immoral? Well, it's, uh, definitely a pen in your hand becomes a potentially dangerous weapon. And, you know, I might think about depriving you of all your pens <laughs> <laughs> if that was the case. Right. Which is making we, pens illegal altogether. But notice, I mean, in, in, in that case, maybe it's like, you know, Twitter banning Trump, right, is taking away his tool of communication because tools of communication themselves can be destructive. And, of course, when we talked about censorship, right, I mean, that's, mm-hmm. that's part of the idea. But okay, let's let, let's get back to things. How about yeah. uh, let's do one more game that might be a candidate here for immoral sure. games. Sure, you you got one, or do you want me to take one? Why don't you go ahead and do the next one? Okay, so this game um, this game came out in uh, in two thousand eight, and it was it's it's a uh, uh, it's called Tetric Dungeon, uh, Calabucho Tetrico. I think it's uh, um, uh, I think it's a, it's a European game, an indie game, and in this game. It's basically a Tetris clone, but it's presented as if you are burying bodies. Actually, you're throwing live Jews into a pit, and it's and it's and it's meant to be medieval Europe, and you're a, you're a headsman, and you're throwing live people into a pit, and they're trying to get out. But it's basically Tetris, and you're trying to basically build them up. And when they when you fill up a row at the bottom, like in Tetris, they go squish, and I guess there's a, a gross squishy sort of sound, and it's really unappealing. Um, uh, uh, there that that could be a uh, an immoral game. Definitely, God, that's it's combining pogroms with uh, the Nazi type killing uh, put together. Right, and 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 what's what's interesting about it is that they didn't know when they made this game. It's, I'm pretty I'm pretty sure that they didn't know that there was a game almost exactly like it in the Monty Python and the Holy Grail CD-ROM game that came out in the late 90s. Really? Where you're ba- it was basically that pl- the plague village in, in, in Monty Python and the, and the Holy Grail. Um, uh, a friend of mine, uh, Leslie Matheson, designed this game. And you're basically throwing bodies in, but there's one of them who's like, I'm not dead yet, I'm not dead yet. And he's trying to get out, and you're basically piling more dead bodies in around him, and you're trying to kill him. I see, uh, in a Tetris but fashion. It's, Right, right. I mean, it's but it's first off, it's not Jews. Right. It's just you know the people in the plague village, and uh, and it's Monty Python. So the context is totally different, right? Right. It's interesting, right? Because last week we talked about when we talked about the virtual pedophilia, we talked about how one of the things that could be you know really bad is you're targeting a specific group of people, right? Right. And with that game, right, you're targeting Jews. That's you know there's an obvious wrongness in that. Uh, but then just right. the fact that it's although it's his- historical, right? I mean, it's 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 a, it's, but it's not like they played historical Tetris, right? No, and right. I, you know, I mean, sure, Jews were thrown into piles of dead bodies, uh, but it's not like you're going to stay. You know, I'm creating an historical educational game, and this is what actually right. happened, right? I mean. That right, would lead right. us to a whole other set of questions, which would be really interesting. If someone was trying to, you know, if someone was trying to actually make uh, a game about the pogroms, uh, um, I'm 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 Jewish, and uh, right. So pogroms, uh, for our listeners, in case you don't know, are essentially the Europeans and especially East Europeans uh, attacks that would come uh, pretty frequently uh, against uh, Jews, where essentially you go into the Jewish village and kill a bunch of Jews or destroy the entire village, um, especially in the 19th century. But they happen throughout all of uh, – God, from the med- yeah. medieval era on. Um, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, uh, one more thing right about the context, right? We know it's Monty Python. We know that they're just trying to be funny. We don't know right. that about ethnic cleansing. In fact, ethnic cleansing, we think the opposite. And maybe the other Jewish game, we're thinking the opposite. We're thinking these guys are trying to make something bad. Right. Or maybe they're trying to make something that is going to be trollish, right? right? Maybe they just want to piss off people and they're not actually purposely making something bad, right? So we don't – at least we don't know anything – I mean I think with ethnic cleansing it was pretty clear. But, <laughs> you know, it is – we – you know, you it's very hard sometimes to tell the intention of, of the designer. That's right. Okay. 
So here we are. We've, we've got some ideas of potentially bad games. We could also have, could have talked about Rape Day or Active Shooter or Manhunt, all games we've talked about before. Mm-hmm. If you want to hear about that, listen to our previous episodes. Now, all these things sound bad, but notice we haven't really given any reasons for why these games themselves are morally bad. So mm-hmm. that's the point of today, right? Um, right. You know, we haven't really talked. Uh, so far, we've kind of dealt with uh, more kind of specific issues, and we haven't kind of talked about the way uh, – you know, ethical theories or moral philosophy uh, might be used as a way to kind of approach video games in general. So I thought this would be our uh, our possibility to do that. So Andy, so yeah. l- let, let me start this by asking you, like, right, how do you decide that a game is morally bad? Let's say, uh, you know, yeah, h- how would you decide that a game is like morally bad? This is an immoral game. Like, I guess the... It- I have to I have to ask you like I I don't know that I've ever thought about that um as 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 an idea itself like is a game more like is this what I would think would I would I ask myself this when I was choosing what to play like I'm thinking about buying this game oh but it's morally bad I don't want to mm. like would is that the the moment or would I think oh this game is you know, I would I would maybe look at it and just go, this doesn't sound like it's fun. Killing, killing, throwing Jews into pits doesn't sound like it's very, very much fun. Throwing people into plague, throwing plague village people into, into pits. That sounds great fun. <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> I, I think that we would probably just like, like think about it in terms of like, well, this, is this appealing to me? Yeah, it's interesting, right? I mean, as players, that's typically the way we do that, right? I mean, yeah. sometimes we might think about, you know, is this game dangerous for me or something? Or, you know, we right. think about this a lot more as parents. So those uh, yeah. parents of, right. of friends of my son that want to stop Roblox and get their kids off of Roblox because they think Roblox is bad. They're not. They don't mean that Roblox is morally bad. They think Roblox is bad for their kids, so psychologically bad for their kids. And right. I, personally, I'm I'm very happy letting my son play Roblox, uh, <laughs> which he he loves very much. Um, but you know, I can see where some of their ideas are coming from. But I, I'm thinking more of like you're like, God, this game might be fun, but. I feel like there's something just wrong about me playing it. So this was one oh, of the sure. options. And yeah. even more than that, I'm thinking like, so, you know, you mentioned GTA 3, right? When GTA 3 came out, the whole prostitute thing came out, people were saying, look, this is just a bad game. This is a game that should be banned. When, mm-hmm. you know, ac- when Active Shooter came out, right? The, you know, the game where you're shooting up a high school, right? Right. When that came out, people said, look, this is just a bad game. It's an immoral game. It should be banned. So a lot of times these kind of condemnations come with the and it should be banned. Right. Now, notice we can say this game is immoral, but uh, we should still have a free marketplace that doesn't ban right. immoral things. So that's a, certainly a possibility. Here in the United States, uh, you know, we allow Nazis to march. Right. We allow them to publish books. Right. So, you know, right. uh, the U.S. at least takes this kind of view on free speech, but other places don't. Right. OK. So um, here's so, he, go, go, ahead. Go, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to say, in my opinion, I think it's the right it's the right attitude to have about free speech, that these things should be allowed to to exist. Um, and but, yet, but there's a lot of. I mean, but I think everybody has to check their own moral guide, you know, their 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 own moral uh, compasses when they get involved with making them. So or they get involved with selling them, or they're involved with, like everybody along that that chain of 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 product has to be sort of questioned about, like, why are you doing this? And and I mostly agree with you. Right. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. I mostly agree with you on this. Right. So, you know, uh, from the you know, from the designer to the distributor on. Right. Uh, all these people should be asking themselves this this question of whether they want to support this thing, even if right. legally we have these kind of though. Part of me is like, this is very American thinking, you know, and, and I'm, I wonder if our American bias kind of shows here. Oh, I'm sure. You know, but um, well, l- let me ask you this. So as a designer. Mm-hmm. What would it take for you to say, like, this, this game is morally bad. I'm not going to work on it. Um, it doesn't actually take very much. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've, I've turned down games. Um, uh, I'm, 
uh, I'm not particularly interested in making games that glorify war. Okay. Uh, I, uh, uh, you know, it's just not a game for me. It's not a game that I'd be good at designing. It's not a game that I'm particularly interested in making. I would turn it down. But you're turning it down because it's just not something you're interested in, or you're turning it down because you think there's something morally wrong about games that glorify war? Well, all of the above. Okay. Um, so, yes, part of that decision would be the moral implications of it. Uh, if, somebody, if somebody asked me a game to make a game that was exactly the kind of game that I like to play, but it was about killing Jews, I would probably say no. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm sure I would say no. Right. So, okay, the targeting of a specific population. Yeah. Right. Um, okay. Right. I, I'm just curious. Anything else that would cross the, the oh, I'm, Andy I'm, Asper oh, any, file? I'm any assuming num- there's plenty. Any number of things. Yeah. Right. I mean, there's, there's, I, the list could go on and on and on. Okay. Uh, then, 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 then let's let's get into it. I, I, I think that's uh, that's not surprising at all, right? I mean, a lot of right. us have that, right these 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 points where we're like, okay, this has crossed the line. I'm not going to associate with this. Though notice, right? Even when you do this, I'm not clear if you're saying this is a bad game, but at least you're saying, I think this has enough badness in it for me to want to have no part in it. Right. I would right. be saying this is a bad idea. A bad and idea. I don't want to, and I don't want to have any part in making it into a game. Okay, right. Which is interesting, right? Uh, let's get back to that at the end. Mm-hmm. The, the difference mm-hmm. between the game and the idea for the game. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, so here's um, so the way I'm going to kind of introduce this is following this philosopher uh, Matt McCormick, uh, something that he published in 2001. So GTA 3 was uh, was out around uh, around then, and it kind of raised this big controversy about violence. So uh, yep. people started dealing with that, and essentially what he does is he takes the kind of three big philosophical uh, uh, moral theories, uh, and he applies them to video games, and he gives us, I think, a pretty a pretty neat general framework of kind of uh, looking at how we can think about whether a game is morally bad. So the first one uh, essentially takes utilitarianism. So utilitarianism mm-hmm. is our first of the theory. Very simply, utilitarianism says that the right thing to do is whichever one of your options will bring about the greatest good for the world. Right. So sometimes people talk about this as the greatest good for the greater number, but it doesn't have to be number. It's just the greatest good. Right. For our purposes, we don't even have to think about the various options. We, maybe we could think about, you know, uh, utilitarianism is really kind of about the good. So maybe the more good it is, the better, right? Right. And good is usually defined by utilitarians as uh, pleasure. And right? that's kind of classic utilitarianism. Other utilitarians define it as preference, preference fulfillment, right? right? Desire fulfillment. You get your needs met by the game. Versus right, desire, sure. desire frustra- so, frustration is bad. Desire fulfillment or need fulfillment? Because I sort of see those desire as slightly different. Okay, so yeah. need fulfillment is not necessarily an issue, or like... right. So typical utilitarianism is not does doesn't make those kinds of divisions. Uh, you know, the the difference between need and want, of course, is never that easy to draw. Um, sure. Right. Um, typically, so to keep it simple, we're gonna just talk pleasure and pain. Okay. Right. Um, okay, so the idea is, does the game lead to more, and we're just going to simplify it, does the game lead to more good or bad in the world? Mm-hmm. Right? So we're and taking, bad, we're talking about like suffering. like Right. Yeah, okay. Right, so good, we're talking about pleasure, bad, we're talking about suffering. So right. th- think about suffering. How can a game make people suffer? So here's, uh, let me let me have our kind of an analogy. If, if I take, uh, if I uh, run you over with my car, and let's say I do it purposefully, right? Mm-hmm. I harmed you. That's a harmful act, hitting you sure. with my car, right? Um, so you can have harmful uh, acts, right? And uh, you can think potentially of these in terms of sex and violence. Uh, and, um, well, uh, let, let's, let, let's skip those, I guess, for now. But So let, let's, th- let's stick with, 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 with this one example. Okay, mm-hmm. now let's say, uh, I, let's say I got drunk and I decided to drive, right? Well, now I'm not harming you by deciding to drive drunk, but I am doing something dangerous. I'm putting you at risk of harm, right? right? So just the decision to drive drunk is, you know, it's not one that is literally causing harm, but we know that it might. We know that it's risky. It's a reckless act. We got to take that into consideration. 
Okay, so we know that video games are not harmful acts, right? If I play GTA, I am not hurting anybody, right? Right. Uh, and as far as we know, uh, neither are they dangerous acts, right? Uh, right. It's not like if I'm playing again. Um, think of your favorite first-person shooter. It's not like I played that and I am putting, uh, you know, the community at risk. Right. But there is this kind of third category that he comes up with: risk increasing acts. Hmm. So the idea there is kind of like, okay, so I'm at a bar, I'm having a drink. Right? I'm having a drink, and that drink by itself is a risk increasing act. Right? Right. I'm not harming anybody when I drink. I'm not doing anything dangerous when I drink, but drinking or having another drink is gonna make it more likely that I, let's say, get in a fight or I get into my car and drive. So it's gonna mm-hmm. be more likely that I engage in dangerous or harmful acts. Right. How much right. more likely? That's never Depends happened. Depends on the to me. person. Right. right. Yeah. Okay. Now, are video games risk increasing acts? Right. So right. that's that's the kind of question that people kind of talked about, right? So if you think, for example, that video games make you more violent, mm-hmm. that would be risk increasing acts. Right? right. So do video games make you more violent? Well, we don't know, uh, the, the, and the jury is still out on that. The jury is still out on that, right? As as far as we know, they don't, but, right, I mean, this is, you know, there's no definitive kind of uh, word on this, right? Right. Uh, but, you know, uh, I don't think we've talked about this yet in the podcast, but we've talked about it uh, elsewhere, right? Uh, we do have some data that says that uh, video games, for example, make you more sexist. Right. Uh, and uh, uh, that video games with sexualized uh, representations of women uh, especially tend to – especially sexualized violence against women tend to make uh, male players more prone to uh, rape myth acceptance, which is right. to say you're more likely to believe things like, uh, you know, she, she was asking for it. Right. right. And you would think this might increase your chances of – uh, you know, sexual harassment or uh, you know, <coughs> maybe even sexual assault. Okay, so far, what do you think? Are games in danger here? Um, no, I don't. I can't imagine that they are. Okay. Um, right. Like I, I mean, on one hand, yes, I, I do believe like games like GTA. When you're talking about about the misogyny, the inherent misogyny of of GTA, the the you know, the only women that are presented are you know, or, or you know, that you can interact with in any reasonable way besides besides characters that, that you specifically have to interact with, but just general people that you interact with are going to be hookers. Strippers. Uh, there's, and that, and then the fact that you can do all this stuff is makes it inherently a misogynist. There's a misogynist viewpoint that went into the game that I hope that the game creators at this point, 20 years later, have have, have you know, thought about and spent some time you know, scrubbing their brain of. Um, yeah, it's interesting. It, it's interesting. What do you do about things like the strip club uh, or the strip mm-hmm. clubs in, in GTA five, which are um, a, I've, I've certainly enjoyed, I, I you know, I, I think they're fun <laughs> uh, and B also fit with the lives of the characters. Right. Uh, they're, you, I mean, yeah, know, they're presenting doing. a world, they're presenting this noir world. Right. Right. Um, but are all the women that you interact with strippers and hookers? Uh, no, some are criminals. No, right. <laughs> some are criminals like me. <laughs> some are criminals like you. So they've clearly like they've upped their game in terms of how they represent women. Um. Okay. Yeah. In- interesting. Uh. Okay. So uh. Then there's the last one, and I th- I think the last one is the most interesting one. So the num one is is the last one is norm supporting acts, right? Mm. So. Um, a game would be – so in this case, a game would be bad uh, if it essentially s- uh, supported bad norms. So, mm-hmm. uh, right, a game would be bad, let's say, if it supported the idea. So this is the – let's say the rape myth acceptance. I yeah. think maybe that will fit in here better. Yeah, if it supported it more norms against women that sexualize women or that you know lead to treating women uh, as, as objects. Um, I actually – you know, I'm thinking about the game, the war game. That you're thinking mm-hmm. about, right? Uh, do do you think that uh, playing games that glorify war ends up uh, impacting the way we, as a society, tend to think about war? 
Oh, absolutely. I think that our, our gun culture is, is, is kind of out of hand. Um, and this is my personal views, and I know not, that not everybody agrees with me, but I believe that between television and the movies and games and, and everything else, we have created this sort of, this sort of like psychological, mythological gun ownership, gun owner hero who, you know, that's the way he solves problems. That's the, his go-to for solving problems. Uh, and it's not necessarily a useful thing. And okay, and this is not just for video games. This is for all media. Yes, and this right, is for all media. Right. So, so, so it, notice, right? The interesting thing is not that you're going out shooting, right? The right, right the first person shooter thing. That's not the problem. The problem is the values that uh, the game is promoting. You, you know, I was, I was thinking, like, I, I, I think back to, um, you know, two thousand four, uh, right? So the election of two thousand four. And, you know, there's this decision to go to the Iraq war, mm -hmm. right? And then there's the, the vote that comes in. And essentially the vote that comes in in 2004 between Gore and Bush, right. no, not Gore and Bush, uh, Kerry and Bush, um, right, right, right. Right? Uh, is a referendum on the Iraq war at that point. And I, I can't help but wonder if, you know, by that point we have tons of war games already, right? If playing those games, let's say, might have uh, made the made people really comfortable with the norm of we solve problems by violence, by going to war, by asserting our dominance. Right. If you would feel more like that if you played games like that and you would be more friendly to a military solution, maybe it made the difference in staying in the war. It might have. It might easily have made the difference of staying in the war. It certainly made the difference in people. Um, uh, joining the armed forces. Oh, I see. So you, you think, uh, I can see that. So you think people played essentially, you know, video games like Call of Duty that essentially, you know, glorified the military, never mind America's army. Uh, but that led them, that made them more likely to go join the military. Yeah, uh, it certainly makes them go and buy these, you know, uh, sort of, uh, I won't call them knockoff, but, but they're basically the the civilian versions of these of these military weapons, and then go out into the woods and shoot a, and shoot stuff in the woods. And and there are a lot of these things are very safe, and people do them very safely. But sometimes, but but the reason that they want to do them at all is because they've been glorified by our cultural interest and our cultural obsession with guns. Okay, now let's take this right mm -hmm. now. Here's here's the way utilitarianism is going to work, right? Uh, utilitarianism is going to say, okay, so you guys uh, just pointed out to some potentially bad stuff, but we right. got to weigh that against the good stuff. Right. And here's what McCormick says about that. Uh, McCormick says, look, it's looking really bad if you're thinking about at least most games. If you think a game like GTA, uh, any of the GTAs, millions and millions and made hundreds of millions, uh, definitely hundreds of millions of people have enjoyed playing those games. Right. Um, you got to weigh all that pleasure, all that joy that people get from playing video games mm -hmm. against the potential harm. And notice, notice I'm saying potential because we don't have any actual harm that would come right. from these games. Or at least we have potential statistical harm that we might not know about. But certainly you got to weigh, And the pleasure just seems to dramatically outweigh the, the, the potential suffering here. Right? That's right. At least for a game like GTA. But what a game! What about uh, a game like Ethnic Cleansing? Right, right, uh, or a game like the one where you play Tetris with the Jews? Can you could you look at could you look at the relative popularity of the game and maybe its sales figures and say that this is an, a a reasonable measure of the pleasure that people are getting from it? I don't I don't know. I mean, it's interesting because we sort right? of monetize that, right? We monetize pleasure. That's the idea of that's the idea of economics, right? So economics is supposed to essentially figure out, and, and economists are almost always utilitarians. Mm -hmm. So, right, they're supposed to figure out how much you want something, how much you like something, by how much you're willing to pay for it, mm -hmm. right? So, what you buy and how much you're willing to pay uh, is an indicator of what it is that you like and want and enjoy, right? right? Um, does that apply to, to games? Um, well, in the sense that GTA was enormously popular, made a lot of money and, and ethnic cleansing is probably did not make a lot of money. Right. Right. Though 
yeah, it's interesting. I, I'm thinking about something like, so let's talk about active shooter, mm-hmm. right? Okay, so active shooter, um, you know, we think about the number of people that are probably going to enjoy playing it versus, let's say, you know, the number, and there's a whole formula for this that, that I won't get into. Okay. Uh, but uh, let's say, let's think about the number of people that would be uh, upset simply by the fact that that game is there. And, and let's think about the, the families of victims, let's say, that might be just really, really horrified and really bothered by the existence of that game, knowing that some people out there are having fun doing something that killed their kids might be right. really, really hard for them. And that bit, you know, that trauma is something that we're going to need to count. Right. Um at the same time, we're also going to need to count, let's say, the financial pleasure this gives the, the, the you know, the game studios, right? Because people get to make a living, mm-hmm. right? And that itself is 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 a good thing. And we, we would need to get that balance. And I'm not that clear that with Active Shooter, the balance would be positive. It might be, but, uh, you know, this is right. something that someone would need to kind of look into. And But this gives you a method, at least, mm-hmm. right, of looking into that. Right, right. It's sort of an int- it's sort of a useful way of of trying to balance these things out, right? Right, right. And and we're treating utilitarianism right as a form of balancing the good versus the bad, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Okay, so let's get now to our second one. So uh, another way for uh, to, uh, to do this is uh, McCormick force uh, focuses on the Kantian approach. The Kantian approach is uh, comes from the philosopher Immanuel Kant, uh, 18th century, just incredibly, incredibly brilliant German philosopher uh, who has the, the second of, this is kind of the big three theories uh, in contemporary uh, moral philosophy. Um, and his theory essentially is, is complicated, but it comes down to the idea that at the foundation of it is what is it that gives people dignity? Right? What makes them okay. worthy of respect? And he says that what gives you dignity is this amazing ability that people have uh, that nothing else in the universe seems to have as far as we know, which is the ability to be free, to make – to have autonomy, right? to make your own decisions, right? mm-hmm. to not be a slave to your uh, – you know, uh, to your, let's say, biological programming, right? Right, and, and that's sort of interesting in terms of games because games are all about choices and all about right. agency. Right, and one of the classic ways to disrespect a player, right, might be to take away their agency, to treat them as if they can't choose for themselves. That's right. But sometimes you want to do that, right? I mean, sometimes you kind of want to play with the player's agency. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, games are all about like, as a game designer, I, all I do is try to figure out what what kind of agency I'm going to allow you as the, the player to have. Mm, right. Complete agency is going to be boring, right? There's no right. parameters, right? Right. Um, and too many choices, too many choices are hard for people to, to figure out. They, they get, you know, uh, there's, there's, a, there's the right amount of choices at the right amount of time at the right amount of speed. Right. Right. Which is interesting, right? The, the illusion of, uh, You know, well, it's not an illusion to say that you have free will if you have limited choices because, I mean, we function in a world of limited choices. Right. Right. Uh, Okay. So the idea there would be that you're disrespecting someone, right, if you're treating them like a thing, if you're using Mm -hmm. them. Essentially, that's kind of really where where it's at, right? You're you're using somebody. Mm -hmm. Uh, If you're using somebody – and this is where the manipulation part comes in, right, that that we talked about in episode two. Yeah. Um, if you're using someone, you're not respecting them as someone that can make their own decisions, this incredible thing, a person, right? That's the fundamental disrespect. Okay, so do games do that? Do games sometimes use people? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, so um, how, how? I mean, there's a lot of games that um, uh, a lot of the free-to-play games are using people for their eyeballs, for their, for their attention, uh, they're they're using them to 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 hold, get their attention, to hold on to their attention for either advertisers. Television does it for advertisers. Their you know free television is there because they're using you to sell advertising. Okay, good. Now notice that might not be bad, right? So here's there's a caveat. I'm I'm trying to simplify what Khan said, mm-hmm. but I think we need one more caveat, right? It's not just using somebody. It's uh sorry, it's not. It's not just using somebody. It's treating someone just as a thing to be used, right? So mm-hmm. let's say, right, 
uh, I can have a, a friend who I treat as a friend, and I also, you know, can ask that friend for a ride to the airport, where sure. I would be using my friend for a ride to the airport, but I'm not treating them just as a thing to be used. I'm, in fact, I'm asking them. I'm letting them make the choice about that. Right. right? So are, are there games that kind of just only use you? Or would you say that uh, would you say this applies to most games? Even I mean I don't know. Is it? Is it well, how, would you, how would you put that? They. The, I think the balance is that it's a trade. Again, I'm letting myself be used for the uh, for the entertainment that I'm generating for myself. Um, and you know, with television and games or whatever it is, where, where it's basically free. I know, I should know, and people should know that that you know nothing's free. You're getting used in some way. You're getting you're 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 generating value for somebody somehow. Right. You're 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 being monetized. You're being monetized, right. which means you're being used. And right. whether or not you're getting whether you feel like you're getting your fair share out of it is kind of up to you. Well, notice, right? I mean, you're being it's it's interesting, right? And we can we can go back to the episode of manipulation. But I, as I said before, I want many more episodes about manipulation because I really like manipulation. Right, and it comes up all the time, right? It's, right? And it's not going to go away anytime soon. So, so notice, right? If if uh, I'm making a choice, right, and you're and you're giving me a choice, like, look, you can play this game, and if you play this game, uh, we're going to use you to make money by throwing ads at you or by giving you the opportunity to, you know, uh, buy some stuff. Right. Right. Or sell your data to people. Right. Um, as long as I know what's going on and I'm making a choice, right? Mm-hmm. You're leaving me the choice. But if you're trying to take that choice away from me, and this is kind of where where manipulation right begins to kind of yeah. happen, right? Uh, if you're trying to take that choice away from me, now you're beginning to now you're using me, right? right? Now you're kind of beginning to disrespect me. And we say that things are manipulative, right? We can uh, talk about them that way. I I have in mind this one of the games that we talked about with censorship. Uh, was kind of a Mario knockoff that wasn't that violated IP, but also mm. like really like threw all these like really expensive microtransactions at you in a trick in a trick way. Again, just ju- just using you, really, just just using right. it, right? Um, okay, so the idea there would be that um, if the game is using you, then it's a bad game, or right. again. I don't. I personally really don't like thinking about it that way. But that that seems to be how the how the thing goes. But notice that's the game. But what if you're using, let's say, that prostitute in you know since we're since we're on this right, mm-hmm. the prostitute in uh, GTA Three, right, mm-hmm. or any of the GTAs afterwards. I mean, you can't. I don't think you can't kill them now, but you can still have prostitutes, um, right? So, but you know, l- l- let's say we're talking about that prostitute. Am I using her for sex? Well, no, because She's not a person, right. right? I mean, the whole point here, right, that people are special, but there's no people in our game. Now, can I use another player? Well, right. yes. And, but that doesn't seem to be a function of the game. That's a function of me, right? Are there games that would kind of force players to wrongly use each other? Oh, I don't know. I can't, I can't imagine that they would have many players left. Right. 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 I mean, there's, that's the that's the thing that keeps us keeps games designers honest is that it's it's such a it's such a free for all in the market that any game that's not actually satisfying to players just doesn't get played. Right. Right. And if you feel like you're constantly be, though, notice if you feel meaning you actually know, right, that you're, you're being used, right, you're not going to yeah. want to do that. You know, there, there's something about these kinds of approaches that also something in me doesn't really like I that that I just. You know, uh, these approaches are kind of made as if it's either this or that, right? So either we talk about utilitarianism or we talked about Kantianism. And it's got to be that one of these theories is right and the other one's wrong. But when we actually look at the way that people talk about these things, it never really works out that way. No, right? aren't they Aren't they really better as, as sort of lenses for, for viewing things? Well, that depends. I mean, if you want a lens that tells you what's right, then they're each... You know, I mean, that's what a theory does, right? Uh, right? It's more than just a perspective, right? It's a methodology of figuring out right and wrong. Okay. But an applied ethics doesn't get that much into these kinds of theories. Uh, these kind of these are kind of 
big ethical theories, we kind of are more in the nitty gritty of things, right? Like, you know, on the one hand, people have a right to do something. On the other hand, they have a responsibility. And by the way, look at this harm that might happen and look at this good that might happen. And we kind of just weigh them together almost case by case. And, you know, maybe we can think of the censorship thing that you and I talked about. Right. Right. At the end of the day, right, does STEAM do anything more than kind of we have a general responsibility to this. We don't want people to, let's say, be more likely to do this. Let's kind of right. weigh our options without a general principle and let's see what kind of comes up. Yeah. And it could be that that utilitarianism appeals to me because it seems more useful in that regard than Kantianism. Well, um, we can expand Kantianism to what's called deontology. Right? Mm -hmm. And deontology is essentially you're dealing with rights and responsibilities, right? And Kant has all this, all this rights and responsibilities that come out out of this autonomy thing, right? But okay. as I said, Kant is a little more more complicated. But you think about rights and responsibilities, and, and we've talked a lot about rights and responsibilities, mm -hmm. right? And we can enumerate rights and responsibilities, right? And our life is full of responsibilities and a whole host of rights, right? And when we think about dynamic reward schemes in episode oh, sure. two, right? right? So I'm the designer and I'm thinking about, okay, uh, what about this idea I had dynamic reward schemes, right? If I'm looking at it through, you know, like uh, the way I would like people, let's say, to think through it, right? I'm looking at the potential consequences, right? What good is this do going to do for all of my stakeholders, for the company, for my players, potentially for their families, uh, maybe for society, if that if there's actually an impact, right? What good or bad, right? So what mm -hmm. good and then what bad, right? Because I got to wait. But I'm also kind of going to look at the question of, um, you know, what responsibilities do I have here, right? Am I wronging these people by trying to manipulate them, right? Uh, and let's say I'm manipulating them, but I'm also doing a lot of good for them. Then right. maybe the good might win out, but maybe if the manipulation is really, really bad, you know, and the, there's not that much good. Maybe. Right. Uh, and I might say I might have even special obligations to uh, maybe my employees. If this game looks really bad, I'm making my, my employees look bad. So, you know, maybe that's a, another part of it. Or maybe right. I have responsibilities, extra responsibilities, some of my players because uh, they're kids, even if I don't know what age they are. I know that there's some kids out there and I might have some responsibilities because of that, and then I have to think also of the potential harms that might come, or the good, because those kids might have a lot of fun. Right, and I think that uh, I think that to a certain degree, these are the kinds of the kinds of things that that people who make games that are very manipulative go through, because you know they they do have employees, they do have children, they do have there's you know stakeholders that 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 are looking for and need. Uh, the income that these that these manipulative kinds of things generate, right? So, right. So, notice, right? Some of their stakeholders are their own families, right? Right, uh, and they count. They definitely can. They have responsibilities and uh, you know outcomes related to mm -hmm. that. So, so notice right, one possibility, and I think this is what we end up doing with any issue. So, you know, censorship uh, and you know the death penalty, right? Mm -hmm. Or these other kind of you know applied ethics issues, right? We kind of take all the kind of more reason we can come up with to use to say, is this uh, right or wrong? Or how, right. or how, or if we think of right or wrong as a spectrum, how right or how wrong this is. Right, right. right. Are there any things that are for you that are just like too far? It's a, it's a black and white issue for you with certain, certain elements. Um, you know, um, I really hate manipulation. Uh, I, you know, mm -hmm. uh, it. I find it an affront. Uh, you know, it, an affront to my dignity. But that that just doesn't say it <laughs> enough. I hate to think people are manipulating me. I, I think it's a. It, I think it's a really big deal, and it's one of the things that that worry me. Uh, which is why I want to have lots of episodes about it. But mm -hmm. you know, I mean, there's. The, so to me, uh, you know, racism is definitely a really big one. Homophobia is a really big one. Mm -hmm. um, but Again, well, m remember those two Tetris games we talked about in the beginning. So let let's say there was the the one with the Tetris with the with the Jews in the pit, mm -hmm. and the one with Monty Python with the 
So, right, with the plague villagers in the pit. Yeah, you know, if Mighty Python did one with Jews, was this in the life of Brian? Which is funny because you know well, they did they they poked a lot of fun at Jews in the life of Brian, but they yeah. were spe- I think they they were kind of more specific to the the time period. Right, right. I mean, but the life of Brian is also. I mean, they're all Jewish. Right, right. right. It's, Literally, it's, everybody, every character in there right. is Jewish. Because right. you know. <laughs> Uh, they're in, you know, Jesus right, except time, for the Romans, which Palestine. are which they right. poke fun even even further at. Right, but 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 let's say that uh, Monty Python did that game with the Jews, mm-hmm. right? It's interesting, right? Because the context is still that it's Monty Python, right? And even and you though would see, you would go, oh, it's a joke, but it's just a not a very good joke, right? Or or maybe it's or maybe somehow they managed to make it into a good joke, because I, I'm kind of open to that possibility. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, I mean, Monty Python was super, super clever. You know, maybe they could make it work. Right. Right. Um, so I, I, I don't. And this is to me part of the context. So a game is incomplete until the player takes that, you know, their oh, takes yeah. their place in the game. And only then you have the game right before that. You right. Just right. The, it's it's unfinished product. until somebody plays it. Right, which means that what the game is is unfinished until the person playing it brings their intention to the game. Mm-hmm. Right, so I could be playing, you know, a game like Active Shooter uh, to try to get empathy potentially for for I don't know how exactly that would work, but <laughs> you know, uh, right, 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 but for 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 the people there or to get an idea of what the the situation was, you know, is like, and maybe the same thing with our virtual pedophilia game. Right, where some mm-hmm. of these are just uh, again, think about ma- the magic circle. The magic circle is a place where you can fantasize and experiment in a in a safe space where it's not real, right? And right. notice that, or at least it can be, if that's what you want the game to be for you. Yeah. So, what does that mean when we talk about whether the game itself is immoral I think, I think or, comes, or not? I think it comes down to neither one of us think that games can be immoral. There's too many questions involved in like the intention of the designer, the intention of the players. Can can a thing itself, like a pen, right. be immoral at all? Right. So 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 maybe the way we should be talking about it is more of is it immoral to do your part in the process of the game that you're either making or distributing in the context that you're making and distributing it to? Right. Right. Or even playing it, right? Because as or you brought it. up. Right. The player is the, is the final link in the chain. Right. You, you know, it's, it's interesting as I'm thinking about we haven't had a, an episode yet on, you know, on sexism and stuff. But, um, you know, take like a sexualized violence against women. Right. And when I say sexualized violence against women, of course, I'm talking about against uh, female figures in games. Right? right. And I think about, you know, Soul Calibur, which is Soul Calibur is my favorite fighting game. Mm-hmm. And I have definitely enjoyed all the violence on the sexual uh, female uh, characters there. You know, I think about it. Okay, so as a, you know, as a player who knows that games like this tend to make, you know, men more sexist, you know, I, mean, I think I got enough like mental blocks up there, you know, to make <laughs> it. But do I, need, do I need to worry about that? And honestly, I personally don't worry, but I'm sure lots right. of people personally don't worry because they think they're okay and right. may not be as okay. Right, and, right. And we know that, you know, people under the age of 25, are, their brains are still developing. So, uh, you know, are you okay or will you be okay in a few years if you're playing this when you're 15 years old? And, and and maybe and notice right this is one social influence among many, right right so it's but there are definitely some things where I want to say okay if you're the distributor and here's a game like Active Shooter and you can think of your part in it your action in it will be to connect players who want to play this game with this game along with connecting the f- interactions it will have with people who are, don't want to play this game but are just going to be impacted by this game right the distributor right. you have the, the ability to kind of do that i definitely think that it could be wrong of you to do something like that and this is why we get at least in part you know censorship right. by game companies you know you didn't want to call it censorship so at least choices <laughs> choices yeah. by game companies or distributors right right not 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 to do that there is one more thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, the last theory uh, is uh, called virtue ethics. Mm. So virtue ethics is a little bit weird. So, uh, you know, we, we use the word ethics and uh, morality 
uh, interchangeably in, in our society, but they actually have two different uh, origins. So morality comes from the, the Latin moralis, and, which uh, has to do with laws, right? Uh, and or rules, right? So when you think about like okay. when you think about morality, it's what's right and wrong. We're looking for the rules, for the principles, right? Right. And okay. ethics comes from the the word ethicos, which is a, a you know ancient Greek word. Um, and ethicos has a lot more to do with how do you live a good life, right? Okay. And and you think about those two questions. One is kind, of, and there there are two kind of ways to think about ethics. One is what's right and wrong, mm-hmm. right? And in our society, that's typically the way we think about ethics: what's right and wrong, right? Right. But in Greek, although that's what you're that's what you're suggesting is more like morality, right? Right. right. We just use the words inter- interchangeably. But the way, let's say, the ancient Greeks thought about it, and you know, many others as well. For example, Confucianism, right, uh, works this way. Is not about kind of how to live, a, you know, kind of what what's right and wrong, but instead focus on what does it mean to be a good person. Right. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to have a good character? And very connected to that, what does it mean to have a good life? So their answer is to live a good life is to be a particular kind of person, a person with the virtues. Uh, You know, in in the case of Confucius, it's kind of like to be this kind of perfect gentleman that just kind of flows through his responsibilities. It's sort of interesting to me that when they were defining how to be a good person, they still had to come up with rules. So the ancient Greeks didn't have rules like this. Or at least didn't well, have. Well, they had the they had the virtues. You're like, this is what you were supposed to do. These are the these are the values you were supposed to have. These are the, right? Well, yes, yes, but those aren't rules. So, for example, if I said, you know, Andy, you should be courageous. Notice, I'm not telling you specifically what to do, right? And the idea was typically that you know, what is courage for you in your context might be different than what is courage for me in my context. I suspect that at any given moment that you say to me, Andy, you need to be courageous, it's because you want me to do something. Or I could tell you, you know, in life, Andy, you just, you know, or I could be as a friend, you know, Andy, there's too many times when, you know, you stop good things from coming to you by being, you know, too afraid of stepping up. You should step up more. You you should have a little more courage. Notice, right? So that, that becomes, but that definitely becomes... Very quickly, something you're you're telling me to, uh, that uh, there is something that I need to do. Right. So it is what's called normative, right? It's telling you what you what you should be doing, right? Mm-hmm. But it's not like what you should be doing in the same uh, sense that you know it's wrong for you to do that. It's more like you should be doing because you would have a better life, you would be a better person, right? You would be you would be better off if you were courageous, if you were compassionate, if you were mm-hmm. honest, right? Um, and by focusing on your character, the idea is – so uh, Aristotle has this uh, – uh, here's what he thinks a good life is. Right? A good life is essentially uh, an active life. So a life where you're actually doing something. Right? Okay. Fortunately, in a video game, you're always doing something or you're often doing something. But I'm not sure how much just playing video games would count as an active life. Right? Uh, but the idea is that you're supposed to be doing things that you're proud of because you're doing stuff exercising the virtues of character and intellect. So that means you're out in the world essentially uh, being uh, being courageous and being generous and being uh, honest and being awesome. I mean that's really what that's really what this is all about. And you're actively being awesome in the world. You know, you have your good character virtues and you have your intellectual virtues, which is you're also smart. So you're right. good and you're sm- you're you're out in the world acting good and smart and that makes you pretty awesome and you're doing that with your friends because you need to share these things with your friends and that's just fun. You know, that's just a good way to live life. People who live that way um are very satisfied with their life. So that that that's the I- the idea, right? With with these sort of virtues. And when it comes to games like GTA 3, as we kind of I know we kind of took a detour Right. Um, at some point in this podcast, we had to talk a little bit about ethical theory. <laughs> yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, in fact, I, I think that our listeners are probably going to want more of it. Um, at some point, we could do more of it. I, hopefully a little bit. I, I don't want to get too caught up in like kind of the details where we kind of move away from games. But I think it's mm-hmm. really helpful to bring in a little every 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 so often. Yeah. So, so now think about a game like, you know, like GTA, right? Um, what kind of person do you become, 
right, by playing a game like this, right? Uh, we think about, or, or let's think about the, the, the games that glorify war, right? Mm -hmm. What kind of person, let's say overall in the balance of good and bad, right, there's nothing wrong with them. Right. But the question now is, what kind of person are you becoming right. when you play these games? And, you know, when you think about what makes you the person that you are, obviously you're thinking, well, you know, genes and my parents, right, mm -hmm. is a really big part of it. But notice we can change, right? And, and the way we change and the way both Aristotle and Confucius and two different parts of the world coming up with similar answers is habits, right? Mm -hmm. um, the habits that you engage in essentially make you. So you're engaged in an act of self-creation all the time, right? Um, now, do games build habits? Possibly. I mean, at the very least, they, they, they become habit-forming in and of themselves. Right. So this is the right potentially gamers excessive. <laughs> games make gamers. Games make gamers, right? Uh, and notice, right, that gamer identification, right? Yeah. That, uh, you know, a big part of my life, a big thing I do often, right, is play games. Yeah. Right? And when I play games, you know, what are the kind of things that I do all the time when I play these games? Am I spending, you know, uh, am I spending hours every day shooting people or shooting virtual right. people? Uh, am I spending uh, hours every day, you know, building things in Minecraft? Am I, you know, spending hours right. every day training with my, you know, with my crew at Rocket League, right? right. Um, and notice those habits can be totally. Am I spending, you know, hours every day, uh, you know, beating up women that are being sexualized? Right. Or am I planting? Am I planting apple apple trees and pear trees in Animal Crossing? Yes. Right. Um, right. All of those. All of those are kind of habits. And the idea is that, you know. Those habits end up impacting the kind of person that you are, right? Mm -hmm. um, and McCormick and other people uh, like him essentially have said that that this is really where you should think about uh, at least the ethics of playing a game. So notice at this point, at this point, it wouldn't really be about whether the game itself is good or bad, right? But whether the game itself is good or bad for you in an ethical sense. So notice, I'm not right. saying for you in a psychological sense. Mm -hmm. Though we could talk positive psychology and whether right. it would although, make you feel more Although it's free. really hard to separate those two things, especially in the sense that the, the ancient Greeks didn't have any separation between them at all. Right, right. So the good life, until recently, it's only around like 20 years ago where psychology makes this turn to focus on, you know, the good life, right? Mm -hmm. Before that, psychology was about sickness, right? And you're starting right. from Freud, right, who is, you know, dealing as a, as a doctor with, with, these, you know, with these issues. And somehow only in, you know, around 2000, you kind of get this movement of, hey, let's talk about what psychology could do for people to make their lives better. Okay. Yeah. Well, we're, we're getting a little off track here. So far off track. Yes, so far off track. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I think this, these are things that we should return to. I, I think it's very oh, worth, we uh, will. very worth thinking about uh, what are the habits that uh, we ourselves uh, have in games. And whether um, – how do they contribute to the kind of people that we are? I agree. All right. Then let's call the podcast Play Nice. You can subscribe and listen to all of our episodes wherever you listen to podcasts.